Welcome to Out of the Lab, a podcast interviewing entrepreneurs who've taken research out of the lab and built it into a company that's serving the world. These entrepreneurs are heroes, and the planet needs more of them. So tune in, learn from their successes and failures, and get inspired. Visit Bountiful.org to join our community and realize your power to save the world. Hello and welcome to Out of the Lab. I'm your host, Max Finder. Today's guest is Teague Egan, the CEO and founder of Energy X. Energy X is a lithium extraction technology using metal organic frameworks. Uh, it's a spin out from the University of Texas and a few other universities like Monash University uh, and others. Teague commercialized this technology and licensed the technology to build this startup, uh, investing in it. And we really hear the details of how he decided to get involved in lithium exploration and extraction and how he found this technology. He read a paper and it's close to my heart actually because I read the same paper several years ago and even had reached out to the professor, Benny Freeman, um, to see what was up with this technology. And so it's inspiring that Teague was able to get on the plane, uh, literally, and uh, make it happen to the point where he built this technology company that's now valued at $300 million, and they've raised a bunch of money, and they, they have contracts and, and other exciting things going on, and a team of something like 15 people, uh, and it all started with reading a paper. So enjoy this uh, very inspiring discussion with Teague, who, who has done a bunch of stuff before he got into technology uh, commercialization. Uh, he invented a, uh, a technology in, in textiles that he patented. He was a, he, he had a record label and he was an NFL sports agent and created a bunch of controversy, uh, in managing a USC football player while he was studying, um, entrepreneurship at USC. So it's really just, uh, an inspiring story of how he built this technology and how he remained persistent. So enjoy, visit Bountiful.work, W-O-R-K, to join our community and enjoy the episode. Thanks. Teague, thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks, Max. So I would love to hear about the origin of Energy X and and how you be how you initially licensed the technology from the University of Texas. It's actually quite a personal story for me because I had read the the paper back in 2018, I think it was, and and had even um, spoke with the professor Benny Freeman a little bit because I was interested in potentially licensing the technology. I was just exploring it, but um, you ended up doing it. So I would love to hear you know the minutia of kind of how you picked up the phone. Uh, and got this whole thing started. Man, that's so cool. I think that uh, you're you're probably the only person that's interviewed me that's read that paper. It was uh, a while ago, too. Yeah, uh-huh. I think the paper came out in uh, 2018, February 2018. And a buddy of mine sent it to me. So rewind a little bit. Um, I, uh, I was I was traveling down in South America, uh, New Year's of 2018, and I came across the salt flats in Bolivia that happened to be the world's largest lithium reserves. And this is kind of, this is where I had my like eureka moment when I was down in, in these salt flats. And uh, I was like, you know, EVs are going to be the next big thing. Uh, we're going to have tens of millions of EVs and they all need huge batteries and lots of lithium. So this is where I kind of thought about what I wanted to do with my future. I I just decided that I want to be in lithium, natural resources, uh, renewable energy and and rechargeable batteries. But I didn't know how, Um, you know, when we were talking a little bit earlier, you said that I'm kind of one of the few non PhD entrepreneurs to do something like this. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, I linked up with a buddy of mine who I actually brought back down to Bolivia a few months later. I said, you know, you have to see this. Like, this is just the craziest place that I've ever been. I mean, it, it almost feels like you're in space. And it has what I believe is going to be 
the most important natural resource of the next 10 to 20 years, lithium. And so we went back down there and I started to learn a little bit more about it and like how lithium was currently extracted and lithium is found in, in salt brine, which is really salty water. Um, and, uh, so he sends me this paper that you, that you just referred to, and it's talking about, uh, this material, um, called metal organic frameworks, which is a relatively new class of material that can, it's really effective at separating lithium from other, uh, salt species out of, uh, aqueous solutions or, or salt brine, like water. And that's kind of, I, I read the paper and I was like, this is exactly what I was looking for. You know, I could like see it in my head. Like we have, we have membranes that can turn ocean water into fresh drinking water by separating, you know, the, the salts out of ocean water. Right. And I said, why can't we use membranes to separate just the lithium out of this salt brine or like, you know, selectively separate all these different salts from one another. And that was kind of the vision that I had in my head. And, but I didn't know, you know, the first thing about membrane separation. So I read this paper, the same paper that you read. And it turns out that this gentleman that you talked about, Dr. Benny Freeman, who was one of the authors of this paper is one of the top membrane scientists in the world out of the University of Texas. So, you know, I'm not a PhD, but what I did, what, what entrepreneurs should do is go find the smartest people in, uh, in the industry or the segment that they're looking to, you know, start a business in. And that's kind of what I did here. I went and found the smartest scientist in membranes, uh, Dr. Freeman, and he's now actually the chairman of our science advisory board and has, you know, pointed countless, uh, of his PhD students and other, other PhD scientists, um, in the sector to our business. And you know, we've built a pretty nice little business. So can I ask, I mean, you had a very interesting career prior to visiting these salt flats. What, what were you doing at the time that you had this epiphany and, and had con and had read the paper and contacted professor Freeman? Um, were you between yeah, so my, things or yeah, I mean, it's a bit of background I realized, but there's a lot of background yeah, to cover. I, was, I kind of was in between things. I was, I was, uh, you know, my, my background is in just an entrepreneurship. Um, you know, I, I identify problems or I, I see opportunity and I kind of go chase that. And that's, you know, energy X is a combination of both of those. Like I saw, um, I saw a problem that, you know, the, the overarching problem being climate change and renewable energy and the transition to renewable energy. Uh, and then I saw this opportunity with, you know, deficiencies in the supply chain. Uh, we're going to need, you know, still to like, if entrepreneurs are listening to this, the electric vehicle supply chain and, and really the battery supply chain is still so nascent. Like we are in, you know, maybe in the second inning now, but like probably still in the first inning of where this thing is going to go. Uh, it's just, it's just still such a minute fraction of the energy that's consumed on a global scale. Uh, and there's so many opportunities along that supply chain to make it more efficient. You know, I'm focusing on the very top of the supply chain, like the technology to produce the raw materials to then produce the batteries. And, but going from the raw materials all the way to the batteries, there's so many steps of processing and refinement and, you know, making these different active battery materials and improving uh, the batteries themselves. Like there's just so much opportunity to make, to, to build a business within this supply chain. So, um, that was the opportunity that I saw, but before this, you know, I was an entrepreneur in entertainment, um, and then in investing and, but, I, but I'm a builder, you know, I built a record label, uh, when I lived in Los Angeles 
uh, and I went to University of Southern California. And I was kind of, you know, if you live in LA, you fall into the entertainment pit, <laughs> I guess you could say. But it's just not where I wanted to be. Like, like running a record label isn't going to change the world. And um, I started investing with some of my profits from the record label. And, and that wasn't really something that I, you know, was, uh, it's not something that I want to be doing. I'm a builder and I was just passively investing and, you know, that it was, it was, it was profitable, but it wasn't exhilarating the same way that building a business is. I wasn't waking up, you know, at 6am and working 18 hours a day to try to build something that, uh, was going to change the lives of people. Like you just trade stocks or, you know, read investment memorandums and stuff like that. And that just, that wasn't me. So I was kind of at this, this crossroads and my dad says to me, he says, T like, what are you doing? Like you're waking up at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning and just kind of lollygagging around. I was making money, but like, I wasn't, I wasn't excited. And uh, he said, you should write down your five passions and why you're passionate about them and then the five industries of the future uh, that you think are going to be the the most important industries of the next 20 to 40 years and and really put like some some thought and effort into this exercise so that's a pretty good idea i'm going to do that so i ended up writing like a few pages on each thing and the two that oversected were renewable energy and space exploration. And, you know, I'd actually just watched the uh, Blue Origin launch this morning. It was amazing. Uh, woke up at 6 a.m. to watch that. But I, uh, I had those two things and that kind of gave me guidance on where I wanted to focus my next business on. And that's, you know, that's how I thought about that. And so you were, I mean, you had, you know, we don't even have to get into it, but you were the youngest NFL agent and you did a, did a record business. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty unique, but the focus was entrepreneurship. And so you visit these salt flats, your buddy comes down, you read this paper, you send, what do you do next? You send an email to Professor Freeman, you reach yeah, out exactly. to the tech. Yeah. Tell me, I mean, can you tell me about if you can remember a couple of years ago, obviously, but can you remember the kind of the details of the process that you underwent in, 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 until you, I guess, were assigned the IP or ho however that worked. Yeah. Let me read you the email. It's pretty, that's pretty, cool. <laughs> I don't think I've ever read anybody this email before. Let's see here. Oh, wait, hold on one second. Um, all right, here we go. I said, hi, Professor Freeman. Um, I run a fund called Innovation Factory. This was like my small investment business. We have been exploring energy investments for some time now. However, we decided to start and operate a new company called Energy X through the fund, focusing on lithium extraction, water desalination, and solar. I've been down to Bolivia and Argentina numerous times exploring lithium triangle, meeting with top executives and government officials. We should discuss collaboration as I'm analyzing different technologies to streamline the lithium extraction process from salt brine. So... That's awesome. So the goal, so you had already developed in your head the idea that you would build across multiple, multiple kind of technology sectors and verticals um, that intersect, obviously. And was this the first piece of intellectual property that you went after? I know that you kind of on your website discussed that you have like 20 or 25 patents or exclusive rights or whatever that is. Was this Moff technology from Benny Freeman, the first one that you undertook to yeah. acquire so, in some so, way? Yeah. So now we have 23 patents, but this this was the first. Um, and was there a plan in your head to kind of, uh, you know, corral all these different technologies together and build a company 
off of that? Yeah, so now now we have a, a multi-pronged approach in acquiring or accumulating um, intellectual property. Licensing is one of those. Um, so we, we look to license technology from universities or other companies. Uh, we also look to acquire IP if there's like a portfolio of patents that, you know, say a company uh, is headed down and, and um, is a distressed asset, we'll look to acquire like four or five patents from a company if we think they're relevant to our portfolio. And then, and then third, we've started filing a lot of our own IP based around you know, the, just the progress that we've made as a business. Um, but, but this was the first, you know, that was, that was literally, so when I got back from uh, South America on the first trip, uh, that was, that was New Year's of 2018. I hit up my one buddy who I knew was kind of like in mining. He, he actually runs a copper um, company or copper extraction company. I said, I've just been down to South America. Like you won't believe like lithium is the next big thing. Like you want to team up and start this company. And he said, well, you know, I'm kind of busy with, with my copper company, but you should talk to this other guy who's in um, solar thermal desalination, like using solar panels for energy to desalinate water. Um, I said, okay, like, I guess I'll talk to him. And then that's when I started to learn that this was really a water-based um, extraction process. Like copper is hard rock where you're leaching copper out of like hard rock ore in a big open pit. Uh, lithium is all, can also be like that, but, it, but its most common form is being a salt in uh, salt water, salt brine, right? Uh, so, so my process was a little bit different than the copper process. And uh, it, it was really a water-based process. So he introduced me to this guy that was doing water desalination, which was a lot more in line with my process. So I talked to this guy and he actually had a small pilot plant up in central California. He was looking at, you know, the California water system, um, making fresh water. Can, what's uh, what's his name? Are you able to share? Yeah. His name is Aaron Mandel and he runs yeah, a company he, called... You know, Water FX. Well, he was—he yeah, was, yeah, yeah. he, hes the first uh, podcast that we did in this series. So he's oh, uh, amazing, amazing. We've, we've interviewed him. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So yeah. So so this guy uh, Andrew Perlman um, introduces me to Aaron Mandel, and I tell Aaron, I'm like, dude, you have to come down to South America and see this. Like, and it's just gonna blow. You know, my mind was blown when I went down there. So I convinced this guy to come down, and uh, he comes down, and we. We literally sneak onto um, SQM's property and like meet with this engineer down there in Antofagasta, and that was like the first meeting that we had that I had with like anybody at a big lithium company. And then it and then I say, okay, now we need to fly to Bolivia. Like you just have to see Bolivia. It's so crazy. So we go to Bolivia, and it turns out the company that uh, that manufactured Aaron's pilot plant in California was also the company that was building Bolivia's manufacturing facility in uh, the salt flat where they were producing lithium. So it's just this crazy line of uh, events. And we got to tour uh, the facility down in Bolivia. And that's the first time that I got to see these huge evaporation ponds that they use. And I was just like, this is so inefficient. Why? And I was asking all, you know, as an entrepreneur, you just ask like, why? And like, why not? And like, why can't it be done this way? Or why is it done this way? Like, uh, you know, I just didn't know anything. Right. And that's, that's kind of a good thing because the, you know, so-called quote unquote experts in a field, they're so brainwashed into the way that things have always been done that I, I attribute part of my success to the fact that I don't know anything. Right. And I just break it down to like first principles right? And, and say like, why can't it be done this way? Or like, why, you know, why do you do it that way? Right. Na naivety is, uh, is, is first principles thinking by extension or whatever. I, I, I definitely yeah. love and agree with that. So, so with Aaron, I was, you know, I, I tried to get him to become my partner and 
you know, I was like, well, I'll partner with you on water FX and you can partner with me on, I was going to call it like, yeah, I was calling it energy, energy Inc or energy X. And, uh, we just couldn't figure it out. Um, he was focused on his business, like rightfully so. And, um, but he's the one that sent me the paper. Uh, hmm. yeah. So, I, so I gotta give, I gotta give cre credit to Aaron where credit is due. And so you email Dr. Freeman and he responds and you guys have a call and like what happens next? Yeah. So, so, uh, email Dr. Freeman, have our first call. I say, I'm going to come and visit you. You know, like as an entrepreneur, you just have to keep following. You just keep have, knocking down the doors and following the path. And like, you just have to be relentless. Like if, if somebody says no, you just have to be persistent and try again or, you know, try somebody else. But I fly out and I meet Dr. Freeman and take him to a nice dinner. And he brings his two PhD students that are uh, like actively working on this technology. Like that's kind of how um, a PhD group works. Like there's the professor who has, you know, Dr. Freeman has 35 years of experience and he has a group of 30 PhDs that are all working on these different technologies. And uh, there were two people that were working on the, on uh, this technology. And in the world of academia, um, you, you kind of try to you study things on a very fundamental level. There's not much focus on commercialization or industrialization. Um, but one of the students, uh, his name was TJ uh, Dylan Schneider, he was he's an extremely bright student and me and him kind of teamed up and he became uh, my first chief science officer. He was like my first real partner on this thing. And Dr. Freeman says, he tells me the genesis of the technology and he was over studying in Australia. Um, so in, in the world of academia, there's a thing called Fulbright fellowships and professors go attend other universities to do cross collaborations. So he went over to Australia for, I think like six or 12 months, uh, two years prior. And that's where, um, university of Texas and Monash university in Australia and Melbourne teamed up on this. Um, so he was sending his group, uh, TJ and this other lady, um, over to Australia to go meet with the other professors and kind of continue the research. So I tagged along on that trip and, you know, I, I met with the other inventors or other authors on this paper who are subsequently the other named inventors on the first patent. And, uh, I just kept following the trail. So basically what I had to do was the first patent was, um, invented by the University of Texas, Monash University, and CSIRO. It had, uh, it had professionals or, or um, principal investigators from all three institutions. So the only way that they could legally license out that patent was to create an agreement between the three institutions. So it, it added another layer of difficulty to this process. So I met with Professor Freeman first in August of 2018, and then I flew over to Australia in October of 2018, and then it took me uh, seven or eight more months. I finally executed our license uh, in May of 2019 because I had to negotiate, you know, the, the combination, the, the well, I had to ne negotiate my licensing agreement with Three Texas. different TTOs, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They had to negotiate their uh, agreement called an interinstitutional agreement between them first, giving Texas the managing rights to legally license it out. It was just this whole big thing, and it just took so long. It was a learning process, you know? Like, I got to be honest. From what I've heard, seven, eight months is pretty good. Usually these things can ah, take a year, you know? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> it didn't feel good for me. I like to move quick. And, and so they were, you were, you spent the entire, what were you doing while this negotiation was kind of dragging on? Were you putting other pieces or looking at other patents or kind of just focusing on your existing business? No, you know, this, this, uh, this was, this was, this, you know, this was it. 
this was it. Like I, but, but there wasn't much to do. Right. Because I wasn't going to risk all this capital before this was my first license. Like right. this was my business is this one license. Um, I, I decided that I needed to get a CFO in place. So in December of 2018, I made my first hire um, other than the chief science officer. So I have my chief science officer, this student under Dr. Freeman, and then I hired a CFO in February of 2019. I started the process um, December of 2018. So now it was the three of us. And uh, but I didn't want to risk too much capital, you know, while I didn't have the license secured because anything could happen, right? Another big company could have swooped in and paid 10 times what I paid, right? Right. And, and, you know, feel free to answer this how you will, but are, are there pieces of the license agreement that you can talk ab about at a high level? Some of the, like, I don't know, royalties or a down payment or any, any kind of thing like that, that you feel comfortable sharing that, and, yeah. and, and if, if so, any lessons learned in there? Yeah, of course. I mean, the point of this is to guide other entrepreneurs, I think, um, you know, I'm very transparent. I'm not going to divulge numbers or anything, but um, we paid uh, a small upfront free, a small upfront fee to Texas, and then uh, there are there's a royalty once we hit commercialization, um, and then there's milestones to make sure that we are successfully progressing the technology. Um, so several milestones along the lines of you know secure partners secure funding, um, secure customers. Uh, and they're all, they're all reasonably timed out. Um, and then uh, the, the, the big kicker is because we had, you know, a relatively minimal upfront fee, uh, we have a large sponsored research obligation for the University of Texas. So like, uh, you know, universities are all about sponsoring research at their university and bringing in funding. That's kind of how they operate. So we, uh, we fund, um, and this was, you know, spaced out in years, like year two, year three, year four, um, a good amount of sponsored research funding to Dr. Freeman's group. So it's a pretty comprehensive licensing agreement. And I had to hire a lawyer to, to do it for me. You know, I'd never done that before. I'd, done hundreds of contracts and, and different things. So I had a really good, like logical business sense of how I wanted uh, the agreement to work, but there's always things that you don't know, you know, and I learned a lot doing that licensing agreement um, for and the it, future. It, and it's sponsored research out of the profits of the company, or you just, whether the thing is progress or whether you're, you know, making money or not, you still have to be sponsoring research in Freeman's lab. Yeah, if I want to continue the license, then there, then there's a sponsored research. Um, and, and and is any of that research beneficial to? Energy yeah, yeah, X? It's all all directly benefit. It's all it's all the research from the original license. Uh -huh. can do that it's, fundamental research. Yeah. So he's furthering that research, and you guys are picking up any new IP that kind of gets generated exactly. along the way. Exactly. And do you have a right of first refusal or something on that IP? It just automatically upstreams into our license. Amazing. Cool. And so you execute this license agreement. And, and, and let me ask you this actually before we move on. So you don't have a PhD. I mean, you, I guess you came with money to invest in, in, in creating a company, which I know is definitely important to these TTOs. I mean, is there any other reasons that they really took you – seriously like were, were you competing against anybody else i mean was there was there something that you did to kind of stand out or show them that you were serious i guess getting on a plane to australia is one thing and and also being prepared to invest is another um, but anything else there that that's worth mentioning yeah i mean i think that uh you have to make you you have to prove that you're the guy to to you know, carry the torch. And that just comes with how you hold yourself and how you represent yourself and, and your really your actions, you know, like 
you know, you said that you reached out to Dr. Freeman, but it kind of fizzled away. Like I was, I was the one that, that got on the plane and went to go visit him. Right? right. And that was the first step. And then, you know, I was the guy that got on the plane to go to Australia and go visit them and shake their hand in person, look them in the eye and say, I'm the guy. And then, you know, right after that, I said, uh, you know, I told them, I said, look, I have all the top lithium companies in the world that will uh, use this technology. And I got on a plane um, with uh, TJ again and went back down to Bolivia and Chile and met with all these people again, you know, and, and, and this whole time I'm writing cold emails, trying to get intros to anybody at these companies that I can go meet with, just make my first inroads. Right. And I'm, I'm the guy that got on these planes and, and traveled to these places and put the dots together and, and business and entrepreneurship is all about putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Right. And building the relationships, uh, progressing the technology, um, getting the customers, uh, you know, there's, there's a, there's a million different moving pieces and, it's just about being the guy that's going to get on a plane and go somewhere to do something. Were, were these like letters of intent that you were collecting from the, the industry partners? Or I mean, that's what I wanted, but it takes a lot to get a letter of intent, a letter right. of intent. Let me tell you that, you know, at the beginning, <laughs> it's just who the hell are you? you know, all, right. I want to do, all, all I want is a response. <laughs> But, but to the TTO, you were like, listen, I've been in touch with this company and we're progressing towards a yeah. letter of intent, something like that. Exactly. Cool. And so, so then you get the license and what do you do next? You raise some money, um, you, you, you pursue DOE grants. I, I, I think I saw that you guys have, I mean, what are some of those first couple of steps that you pursued yeah. after that? Yeah. That, that's where, you know. I've been, I was very fortunate to have my own money to invest in the company, which is, uh, provided myself, you know, less dilution than what a typical startup company might see. Um, you know, in most cases, somebody after they, even, even maybe before, uh, they execute the license may have had to go, uh, raise some capital to do that. You know, I, I'd say before I executed the license in May of 2019, I had, you know, I, I got really good lawyers to help me on that. Um, but I probably spent 50 grand total between my lawyers. I think my lawyers, I spent like 25 grand and then I spent, uh, another 25 grand, like flying all over and like, maybe building like a, a small website or, you know, just like miscellaneous stuff. Um, hiring, hiring the CFO, I was paying him like four grand a month. So I had paid him for maybe three months, February, March, April, May, four months. So that's, you know, that's, that's 16 grand, uh, starting to put the financials together like this and that. Uh, my, my operating docs, I paid another lawyer like to register the company or no. Yeah, I registered the company in December of 2018. So I had to do that. Just like housekeeping stuff. Um, then once the license is executed, you know, you can go out and raise more. Like that's a huge milestone, right? You have the technology, you have the license, you can go raise more at a higher valuation. Again, I didn't have to do that. So I just kept investing myself. Um, I didn't raise outside capital until... Uh, the summer of 2020. Um, and you know, I, I had gotten our, I'd gotten my valuation up to 60 million at that point. Um, I had invested a million of my own money to get it there. And then we raised outside capital summer of 2020 and to date now we've raised 15 million, um, at a, at a, at a most recent valuation of 300 million. So awesome. It's been, it's been pretty good. Yeah. And at what point did you decide to start acquiring more IP other than the stuff that was continuing to come out of professor Freeman's lab? Like at what point did you kind of see this as a platform company that you would, 
move into other sectors and 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 consolidate IP like this because that's an it's a strategy that I don't you know I feel like I'm not sure a lot of people do maybe it's good maybe it's bad but maybe you can speak to that a little bit honestly immediately like I think that I look at energy exploration technologies as as what I described before, there's so much opportunity in the battery and EV supply chain. And we want to vertically integrate technologies to make that whole supply chain more efficient. Um, you know, lithium extraction is our first products to market. Uh, but there's a lot of tangential aspects of that. There's a lot of, you know, added layers, um, you know, I see, I see energy X being a 10 plus billion dollar company in, in the near future. And it's not going to be from one technology. It's going to be from amassing, you know, as much of the supply chain as possible. Um, obviously all this stuff is related to each other. Right. So it's just kind of like layering it on. Yeah. And so was there anything that you would, um, or anything that you, would say would improve the process of this licensing or this, you know, kind of early stage deep technology company building uh, endeavor that you went on, like anything that you think, uh, any insights into how the, the process can be approved, how we can get more entrepreneurs doing what you did? Um, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is, uh, I don't know if it's a if it's a born trait. Like I, it can certainly be learned, but it's just about it's just about optimism, you know, and, and growing up believing that you can do anything. Like my my dad told me that I could do anything when I when I grew up, and you know, I, I obviously got to witness him be an entrepreneur. But like I was uh, I was fortunate to be brought up with that mindset, right? Like anything is possible, and I think that it's just about going out and doing it. You know, so, so many people just hope or wish and hope, hope is not a plan. You know, I create, I create a plan and I execute on the plan and then I create more plans and execute on those plans. And I get on airplanes when I need to get on airplanes and I go places and I meet people and I connect dots and I put things together and, you know, I identify opportunities. Like there's so many good ideas that are out there and, there's so many, there's so many technologies that are out there in the university waiting for entrepreneurs like myself to come, uh, turn into reality. Um, you just have to, you just have to get out there and read a scientific paper. Or right. Two. Cool. Um, and so is there anything that you would sort of tell your younger self? that you would do differently? I mean, is there like, even if you had to think about um, one of your biggest kind of mistakes or learning experiences from this entire process, anything that comes to mind? Um, Avoidable mistake, you know? <laughs> uh, let me think. I think, you know, somebody asked me this question the other day that couldn't even think of a good answer, but I, you know, I try not to live with regret. I think that everything happens for a reason and there's a silver lining and everything. Um, you know, one of the biggest, one of the biggest uh, decisions that I just made for the company was we just relocated our entire company to Austin, Texas. From where? Uh, from all over, it was remote. And we had people in uh, California, we had people in Utah, Florida, New York, Washington, DC. And I thought that the company was running successfully remote and it was part and parcel to the fact that we didn't have our own lab space. We, we were contract manufacturing lab space out of some of our partners in the, the Bay area. This group that uh, is called MTR, Membrane Technology and Research. And they're kind of some of the top membrane experts in the world. And uh, the, the VP of technology of this company is actually a former student of Benny Freeman, Dr. Freeman. So it just shows you like where Dr. Freeman sits on the totem pole. He's at the very top. <laughs> but we we're also working out of Dr. Freeman's office or his labs at UT. We didn't have our own spot. And there was this huge discussion of do we wait 
until we get our first pilot plants in the ground uh, down in South America, or do we move right now and consolidate the team? And it's the best decision that we made to do that uh, before, uh, or like as soon as possible. You know, learnings, like, I think that it's not something that I did wrong, but the most important thing about being an entrepreneur is, is persistence. Like the first chief science officer that I told you about, um, who was a student of Dr. Freeman's, he left the company like a year into it. You know, he didn't believe in it or he was having, you know, personal problems and he, uh, he didn't have the persistence. And then the first CFO that I hired, um, who was with us for two years, you know, things were happening a little too slow for him. And, you know, we were always just on the cusp of raising funding or we were just almost there. And he said, you know, I've had enough. Like, so I lost the two, my two closest people that, uh, that I pretty much started the company with. And, you know, I just had to have the perseverance. Like it was hard. Like I didn't think that I would be successful at times. I thought that, you know, this is, this is the end or you know, I never thought this is the end, but like, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what my next step was, but as the leader, you just have to get up the next day and just wake up at 6am and start writing emails or start, you know, pick, pick yourself back up. And I think that is the most important thing that I've learned um, as an entrepreneur over the course of my career. And, and you, you, you've been known to talk about 100-hour work weeks, and you, you've said it a few times, this 6 a.m. start. I mean, you know, looking you up, you have a lot of other uh, things on the go. I mean, this technology company is probably going to consume a lot of your time. I mean, do, do, do you see it eating up more and more? I mean, is, that, is it something that you put in 80 hours and then do other things on the, tw the other 20 hours of that work week? I mean, how does your day kind of look? No, I, I have nothing else going on. This is- my This is school. number one. This is number, this is it, this is it. I wake up and think about this and I go to sleep thinking about this and it's all day, every day. Uh, that, that's what I was kind of looking for is to understand, you know, I mean, to reiterate, I guess, that that's what's required, right? Yeah, that's what's required. Okay, well, Teague, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, is there any kind of remaining pieces of advice? You know, a lot of our listeners are kind of grad students, scientists, entrepreneurs that are looking to build meaningful technology companies. Uh, anything you would tell them? Any pieces of wisdom or final pieces of advice? No, I think, I think what we've talked about here is pretty, pretty spot on, you know, it's just persistence. If work, yeah. If you're going to work harder than the next person and, and be the guy that it's, it's, it's on the plane, following your dream. Yeah. Get on the plane. Just yeah. get on the plane. <laughs> um, awesome. All right. Teague, well, uh, CEO, co-founder Energy X, where can people find you if they want to kind of connect or reach out? Just uh, energyx.com. Okay, energyx.com. Tiggy, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. Cool. Thanks, Max. Have a good one. Thanks for listening. But now we need your help. We're building a community of scientists, students, entrepreneurs, industry leaders, and investors to commercialize meaningful technology and research. Join us at bountiful.work today to find opportunities and realize your power to save the world.